Good afternoon. I'm Shanika Morris of the Association of Research Libraries, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, IPED's Academic Library Definition Changes for 2016-17. There are a few announcements before we begin. All participants have entered the conference in listen-only mode. We invite you to join the conference by typing questions in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Robert Dugan will answer short questions or questions that probably have a yes or no response while the conference is in progress. For longer questions, we will submit all of those to the presenters at the end of the conference, and the speakers will answer the questions at the very end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded on Thursday, July 28, 2016, and ARL will share the presentation slides and a link to the recording in the next week. Today, we will hear from IPED's program staff as well as members of a joint ARL-ACRL task force on aligning IPED's academic library's component definitions with established practices. Our presenters are Mary Jane Petrowski, Associate Director of the Association of College and Research Libraries, Martha Kirilidou, Consultant, for the Association of Research Libraries, Robert Dugan, Chair of ACRL Academic Library Trends and Statistics Survey Editorial Board, University of West Florida, Chris Cody, National Center for Education Statistics, Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System, Oliver Pesch, Chief Product Strategist, EBSCO Information Service, and Kristen Martin, Electronic Resources Management Librarian, University of Chicago. A warm welcome to our presenters and all of our attendees. And now, to begin the presentation, I would like to turn the floor over to Martha Kirilidou. Martha, please go ahead. Hello. Um, the, this slide shows the joint task force members. And um, uh, Mary Jane Petrovsky and myself are representing ACRL and ARL in this call. And Mary Jane Petrovsky, would you like to go ahead? Thank you, Martha. Um, on behalf of the um, the Association of College and Research Libraries uh, Statistics Program, I would just like to remind uh, all the participants that our annual survey, our annual trends and statistics survey, is now going to uh, include the IPEDS academic library component that we're going to be talking about in great detail today. So just wanted to let everyone know that we include that as part of our annual survey so that you can download your data and transfer it to um, your iPads key holder. Um, we've gotten a few questions about when our next survey will open, and that will be uh, very soon on September 1, and we will close on February 15th. We are trying to align our survey with um, the, the iPads survey period. And we intend and hope to make uh, our 2016 data available uh, by late spring of next year um, as part of our ACRL metrics um, uh, statistical product. And a few and words back about to the. Thank you. A few words about the ARL statistics mailing. There, there are no survey changes for the 2015-16 survey cycle. The forms and the mailing are now available, and the due date is October 15th, 2016. Uh, Shinika is expecting your uh, results and data, and the data are available to the members who are contributing as soon as the data are submitted. 
on many of the iPads, uh, academic uh, library data elements are, of course, uh, part of the ARL statistics. Um, so with this brief introduction on the association-specific surveys, uh, we can talk which are trying uh, we are trying to align them as much as possible with the iPads um, framework. Uh, we um, and which this is the main work of this task force. I'm glad to um, uh, invite to Bob Robert Dugan uh, as co-chair of the joint task force uh, to um, describe the more specific work of our task force. Bob. Thank you, Martha. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a couple things about the Joint Task Force. Um, it's a joint task force from, of ACRL, ALA, and ARL um, appointed members. And the task force um, was um, in place last year um, in, which they in which the membership provided uh, recommendations and suggestions to IPEDS concerning um, the definitions and the instructions for the academic libraries component, the AL component, for the 2015-2016 um, year. Um, the suggestions were accepted from the task force, and IPEDS made some changes to the uh, survey um, in, in, in hopes of improving it. Um, this year, we reconvened, and we, are, we have provided suggestions and recommendations to IPEDS um, again. And, um, and those changes are what we're going to talk about today. Um, the task force is made up of, of academic librarians from the various Carnegie classifications. Um, and it's under the oversight of ARL, ACRL, and, and Martha facilitates it. Um, most of our work is done through conference calls. We also share Google Documents. And we have had, in the past um, two years, face-to-face -face meetings at, um, at ARL in uh, Washington, DC. Um, so we, we have been working in terms of, of with the survey directors, uh, iPad survey directors, in terms of improving um, the instrument and, and making it a little bit easier for the libraries to, to work on this. Um, today we're going to be discussing specifically those changes that are going on be, uh, with the 2016-2017 academic libraries component. For those who are, most of you are familiar with iPads. It's, it's a term that we use a lot, um, or a, a place we talk about a lot on, in higher education. But this is just the, um, the definition or the, the actual mission um, of um, iPads. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Christopher Cody, who is the Academic Libraries Component Survey Director. Chris. Thank you, Bob. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as Bob said, I'm Chris Cody. I'm a senior researcher for American Institutes for Research, where one of the projects I direct is with IPEDS, as I serve as a survey director for academic libraries, as well as um, fall enrollment and 12-month enrollment surveys for IPEDS. Um, today, I'm going to go over the upcoming changes to the 2016-17 collection for the academic libraries survey. Prior to going into the changes, uh, let me first go over how these changes have come about. Um, IPEDS collects basic data from approximately 7,500 post-secondary institutions in the United States and the other jurisdictions that are eligible to participate in the Title IV federal financial aid programs. All Title IV institutions are required to respond to IPEDS. IPEDS also allows other non-Title IV institutions to participate on a voluntary basis. The National Center for Education Statistics, also known as NCES, recently saw authorization from the Office of Management and Budget, Budget to continue IPEDS data collection. Cur our current authorization expires December 31, 2016, and these authorizations usually last three collection cycles. So IPEDS is now or has recently requested a new clearance for the 2016-17, 2017-18, and 2018-19 data collections to enable us to provide consistency in our collection of post-secondary data over the next three years. It is during this window between our OMB clearances that allows us to change IPED surveys substantially um, based off several factors that we'll get into in the next slide. With the OMB package, the Department of Education, in accordance with the Paper Reduction Act of 1995, provides the general public and federal agencies with opportunities to comment on proposed, revised, and continuing collections of information. 
What this does is it helps the department assess the impact of its information collection requirements and minimizes the public reporting burden. It also helps the public understand the department's information collection requirements and provides the request, requested data in the desired format. The Department of Ed solicited comments on the proposed information collection request of IPEDS. The Department of Education was especially interested in public comments addressing the issues of the collection, of the timely manner of the collection, any estimates of burden, accuracy, how might the department enhance the quality and utility and clarity of the information be collected, and how might the department minimize the burden of the collection on the respondents. There are recently two comment periods for our OMB package, a 60-day period, which closed in April, and a 30-day, which recently closed on July 25th. During this period, people and organizations were able to comment on the proposed changes provided by IPEDS, and IPEDS responded to the comments, oftentimes resulting in additional changes to the survey, the instructions, frequently asked questions, or tips that are being added to the survey. So while the OMB package is now closed, for comments, it's actually it's up on um, the website provided to you on the slide, and the comments can be viewed using the commands presented on the slide. And if you go to the website, you can see what would the proposed changes to the upcoming collection cycle were, as well as what people comments people had about the proposed changes. So, how did these proposed changes to iPad survey come about? There are seven different avenues that a survey for IPEDS can actually change. Um, many of them occur based off what we call our technical review panels, also known as TRPs. Meetings of IPEDS TRPs are conducted by Research Triangle International to solicit expert discussions and suggestions on a broad range of issues related to post-secondary education and the conduct of IPEDS. A TRP is designed to allow the public to advise and work with RTI to improve IPEDS data collection and product data quality, and user friendliness. Also, these changes to IPED surveys during the OMB process can occur through quality control of reported data. This is where basically, based off the reported data, we've identified areas where we need to clarify uh, questions, reanalyze how we are presenting questions and instructions, and then those changes are made. Also, uh, through work from interested organizations, changes to IPED surveys can occur during the OMB clearance. Such an example is this Joint Task Force Committee um, to provide substantial feedback during the OMB comment period as well as prior to us presenting changes to the OMB process um, that has helped uh, develop the next collection of the survey. Also, feedback from institutions or comments during the OMB package can help um, or will allow us to uh, change uh, items on the AL survey. Today, when we discuss many of the proposed changes to the academic library survey for the upcoming collection, most have actually come about um, due, due to uh, the hard work from this task force, and we'd like to thank them very much for their work. So before I move into the overall changes for the AL survey uh, for the upcoming collection, here's a graphic of all the surveys and the time period they open and close for collection. As you can see, the Academic Library Survey opens for collection this upcoming cycle on December 14, 2016, and closes for key holders of the institutions on April 12, 2017, and IPEDS coordinators on April 26, 2017. Preliminary data is then released to the public um, for the Academic Library Survey in mid-fall of 2017. Okay, so now on to the changes, which I'm sure many people are here to listen to. Um, we're making some question changes to the survey in this upcoming collection cycle, as well as realigning and updating our instructions to meet the academic library's industry standard on how things should be collected, which was largely based on the work of this task force. First off, who reports to the AL survey? It's po our post-secondary degree granting institutions that either have access to a library collection and or have library expenses greater than zero dollars um, are asked to report to the academic library survey. This results in about over 4,000 institutions reporting each year to the AL survey. The reporting period for the AL survey is for the fiscal year of, for the fiscal year of 2016 or for this upcoming collection. Is fiscal year 2016 defined as the most recent 12-month period that ends before October 1st, 2016 or that corresponds to the institution's fiscal year. So there are two sections to the Academic Library Survey. 
Section 1 is the library collection, circulations, and interlibrary learn loan services section. Um, last year this was only known as the library collection and circulation section. Um, the changes we are implementing for this upcoming collection that we'll begin to uh, we'll begin again, begin to collect information on um, we'll go over first dealing with section one. Um, the one of the first and major changes that we are implementing is that we'll begin collecting information for physical serials and digital electronic serials um, for collection, as well as we'll begin to collect information for physical serial circulation. I'll get more into this in a in a future slide. We are also, as I kind of stated previously, are moving the interlibrary loan service section from Section 2, which deals with expenses, to Section 1 of the Academic Library Survey, since this deals related more to access. We are also adding a screening question for this section that will ask if you have interlibrary loan services. If you do not, then will not, you will not be asked to answer additional questions on that area. We are also updating and changing some of those instructions to reflect the most recent addition of serials and to respond to recommendations from the task force, this, this task force and OMB comments. So the update to the instructions I'll go over um, briefly. Um, I'm going to first skip the physical books as I've devoted an entire slide to it shortly. In regards to the physical media, while we're still asking in the instructions that institutions report the number of, number of titles of media materials, we are explaining what to include differently. We ask now that you include audio vision, video materials, uh, audio visual materials, sorry, cardiographic materials, graphic materials, and three dimension artifacts and realia. In regard to physical cir circulations, our update of the instructions, we are now asking that you report the total number of times physical items are checked out from the general and reserve collections. Reserve is, at, is new this upcoming cycle. We are still asking that you include only initial checkouts, non-renewals, and not renewals, and exclude interlibrary loan lending and borrowing. We also ask that you'll include books, media, and serials in physical circ circulations. And we'll ask that you do not include transaction equipment or computers. However, circulation of electronic reading devices can be included if the device is preloaded with e-books. In regard to digital electronic books um, for the upcoming collection, everything has stayed the same in terms of instru instructions, except we have added to the instructions to include open access titles if the individual titles are searchable through the library catalog or discovery system. Except we are asking that you do not count e-book titles from Happy Trust, Center for Research Libraries, Internet archives and similar collections unless the library owns the digitized item and is accessible under current copyright law. Finally, for updating instructions for Section 1, for digital and electronic circulation usage, we ask that you report usage of digital and electronic titles, whether viewed, downloaded, or streamed, but that we're asking that you do not include e serials and in institutional repository documents. However, we do ask that you include e books and e media titles only. So as to, to reiterate, we'll be collecting physical serials collections and circulation, but we'll only be collecting e-serial collection. We will not be collecting e-serial circulation. Now moving on to a little bit more detail of physical books, and then we'll talk about serials directly. First, this year we are going to change how we collect information on physical books based on recommendation from this task force. We will now ask that you report physical books by titles, not volumes, as seen on the definition ch or instruction changes on the screen. For 2016-17, we're asking that you report physical book titles owned or leased by the library. If individual titles are cataloged and or searchable through the library catalog or discovery system, we ask that you exclude serials, microfilms, maps, non-print materials, and uncatalogued items. We ask that you include music scores as searchable by title through the library catalog or discovery system. Also include government documents that are accessible through the library's catalogs, regardless of whether they are searchable, separately classified or, and or shelved. Catalog includes documents for which records are provided by the library or downloaded from other sources into the library's card or online catalogs. So just to reiterate, the main change here is that we are moving from collecting physical books by volumes to collecting physical books by titles. 
In terms of serials, these are new instructions added since we have not collected serials before. Um, in terms of physical serials, we ask that you report the number, number of physical serial titles that are accessible through the library's catalog or discovery system. A serial is a publication in any medium issued in successive parts bearing num numerical or chronological designations and intended to be continued indefinitely. This definition includes in any physical format periodicals, newspapers, and annuals, the joint, uh, as well as the journals, memoirs, proceedings, transactions, etc., of societies, and number monographic series. Report serial titles, not subscriptions. If possible, report the count of only those duplicate or otherwise unique serial titles searchable through the library's catalog or discovery system. system. If possible, do not include either earlier title changes. However, do not worry about removing them if not possible or feasible. And then in terms of reporting digital and electronic serials, we ask that you report the number of e-serial titles that are accessible through the library's catalog or discovery system. A e-serial is a periodical publication that is published in digital form to be displayed on a computer screen. Well, it might be a little bit difficult to see. Um, this is a screenshot of what the future survey screens will look like for the 2016-17 uh, collection. Um, one thing you uh, like to make note is you see the addition of serials, um, as well as the moving of the interlibrary loan services to Section 1. Also, when filling out the survey, remember that we provide previous year's totals but in the upcoming collections, these may look very different based off the instructions for 2015-16 and what we are now requesting a report for 2016-17. For example, where books are um, prior year will show numbers and volumes, where the current year is asking for numbers based off titles. Moving forward to the Section 2 of the Academic Library Survey. If an institution has expenses greater than $100,000, they are asked to report in Section 2 of the AOL survey. The changes to Section 2 include relocating interlibrary loan services to Section 1, as I previously stated, and removing the question, does your library support virtual reference services? This was a recommendation by the task force, and through data analysis, this question was no longer needed as most institutions support virtual reference services. Finally, we updated the following instructions based on library, the library community's feedback. For um, material and service expenses, um, we have changed a few of the instructions, one being uh, regarding how you report one-time purchases of books, serial, back files, and other um, materials. We have uh, removed a section that says do not include current subscriptions of materials, or uh, serials, subscriptions of serials, sorry. Um, this change was just more of, uh, for clarification in our instructions and to eliminate some confusion. For reporting ongoing commitments to subscriptions, we have added in, this, uh, in the instructions that you also include serials and any other items committed to annually, as well as an annual e-platform or access fees. Um, and then we have also stated that serials are publications issued in successive parts usually at regular interval and as a rule intended to be continued indefinitely. So the change here is wording clarification on how to report serials and any other items committed to annually, as well as annual e-platform or access fees. In regards to um, other materials and service costs based for materials and service expenses, um, we have updated the instructions where we have added one line where we're asking that you include costs associated with pay-per-view journal article transactions. And we have also removed a line where we ask that you re report expenses such as those for cartographic materials and manuscripts. And finally, in the instruction sections for all other operations material expenses, um, we've added to the other items that are supposed to be included in this section that you also include interlibrary loan fees paid to bibliographic utilities that you cannot separate out. Um, and so this includes interlibrary loan costs and all other operation expenses with the library's expenses of the bibliography utility. Um, this is only in the situations that cannot be separated out. Here's the updated Section 2 screens for the AL survey for the upcoming collection. As you can see from here, we've removed the virtual reference service questions. 
and we've also removed interlibrary loan, loan service questions and moved them to Section 1. Um, finally, when filling out the survey, please remember to print any new survey materials with the updated instructions, FAQs, and glossaries to ensure you're providing data based off the most recent, recent set for the upcoming collections as these items have changed. So any frequently asked questions, any instructions you've had from previous years, years of reporting, um, it would be probably best to disregard those and, only, and print out the new materials once they are um, available on the iPads website as those are now how the instructions and the uh, FAQs uh, that we're aligning the instructions to. I'll now pass um, the discussion on to Oliver to discuss counter and sushi. Thanks, Cody. Um, I'm Oliver Pesh, and um, I work as a product strategist at EBSCO Information Services where my focus tends to be on our knowledge base and librarian productivity tools, including some of our usage uh, consolidation products. Uh, but more relevant to this webinar is probably my activity with Counter NISO. I serve on the board of directors of both organizations, and within Counter, I chair the working group that's looking into the uh, technical details related to Release 5 of the Counter Code of Practice, and I'm also co-chair of the NISO Sushi Standing Committee. So, so my goal today uh, is to provide some background on Counter and Sushi and how these standards impact and facilitate the iPads reporting. And I'm also available to answer questions that may come with regard to usage or, or Counter or, uh, or Sushi. First, for those who may want to just a real quick refresher on Counter and Sushi, uh, counter is a code of practice that when followed results in a content provider offering consistent, credible, and comparable usage statistics of this scholarly online information. The code of practice lists the reports to include, specifies how those reports should be formatted, the metrics to include in those reports, how transactions should be processed, and how reports are to be delivered and credibility is enforced through the required annual audit that each content provider must go through. SUSHI, which stands for the Standardized Usage Statistics Harvesting Initiative, resulted from a need to address scalability problems with counter-reporting. So with multiple reports per content provider and uh, usage um, being found at dozens of provider sites, the effort of retrieving the hundreds of reports can be overwhelming. And Sushi solves this by enabling automated harvesting of counter usage via web services. Sushi is an expected feature of an ERM or usage consolidation product. So once you have it configured, um, that should eliminate the need to manually retrieve the counter reports. Um, here's a quick historical timeline of counter and sushi, um, which I've included to put these standards in, in perspective. Counter has been around for more than 15 years and was the result of collaboration among members of the Publishers and Libraries Services Group. Uh, and they were seeking consistency around usage reporting of the growing online collections. And this is sort of the late 90s, early 2000s. Counter was formed in 2001. The first code of practice was released in 2003. Sushi came along in 2007 as a means of automating the loading of usage into ERM systems. And currently we are at release 4 of the counter code of practice. Work is underway on release 5, and we'll have more on that later. And the other event on the timeline to highlight, I think, is the introduction of USIS in 2005. USIS is a community website focused on issues related to usage. It's sponsored by counter, but run by members of the community. Uh, you can access it at usis.org.uk. Um, if you haven't been to the site, I recommend you go have a look. Uh, you can submit questions. If you have problems with a vendor, uh, submit the issue there, and they will basically take care of finding a resolution for it. So it's a great site. Okay, so turning back to the iPad survey, 
Um, and the form in question is here. And uh, we've circled in red the uh, library circulation for digital electronic resources. And this is where the counter reports uh, should prove helpful in providing the counts for this entry. So iPad specifies, as Cody said, it's about reporting use of titles, whether viewed, downloaded, or streamed. And that maps nicely to counters full text requests metric. Um, as Cody mentioned, iPads limits the count to circulation of ebooks and media and excludes the use of these serials and content in institutional repositories. So the counter reports where you'd find the information you need to report on this would be Book Report 1, Book Report 2, and Multimedia Report 1. And the Multimedia Report would come from organizations like Alexander Street Press who offer collections of um, multimedia audiovisual uh, resources. So the bottom half of the screen we see the sample of Book Report 2. And in red is the number that you need, the, your reporting period total for that report. So basically you would run your Book Reports 1 and 2 and Multimedia Reports 1 for all of your providers, add up these totals, and enter the number on the iPads form. And if you happen to be using an ERM or usage consolidation product, you may be able to save some time by pulling a single report that consolidates usage across all of your platforms. But that's basically where you get that information. So I'm sure a few of you have experience some challenges or questions with book reports. So let's talk about that just briefly here. Book Report 1 is provided by ebook hosts that deliver the complete book in a single file, a single PDF. And Book Report 2 is offered by ebook sites delivering books in sections, sections like chapters or pages or entries in a reference book or encyclopedia. So a, a, a given ebook host will typically provide one or the other, but not both. So they're kind of mutually exclusive reports. So a quick example of the problem. So let's say we have two identical users, each accessing a book on two sites. The first site they access delivers the book as a single PDF, and the second site delivers the book by chapter. Our identical users each read five chapters of the book in a sitting, for Site 1, that activity will show up on their Book Report 1 as a single download. However, Site 2 will show five downloads for the same book in their Book Report 2. And so the problem, as you can kind of see, is the usage is not really comparable between the hosts and between the reports. Um, you know, you're adding up Book Report 1 and Book Report 2 stats in the uh, IPEDS reports. And so the result is going to be a somewhat inflated number when compared to print circulation, which tends to record things at the title level. But it's just something to be aware of. And we'll talk a little more about the solution that's coming up with Counter on the next slide. So now looking ahead, uh, several initiatives are underway which should increase the number of publishers offering counter reports, improve the quality of what they offer, and make it easier to access and use the counter reports. So in development now is the counter report validation tool. And this is a free tool uh, that will be made available to librarians, content providers, auditors. And it will allow them to check to see whether a counter report or a sushi implementation is indeed valid. And once it's in place, uh, we hope to see a significant decrease in the uh, reports that are released that are not quite compliant. And I'm sure we've all, all, of, all of us have used counter have experienced some of these. Uh, the NISO Sushi team is working on Sushi Lite which, as it sounds, is a simpler version of Sushi, uh, one that's quicker to implement, allowing content providers to become compliant with less effort and hopefully fewer compliance issues. 
it will also allow other applications to be able to take advantage of Sushi and automatically include the counter statistics um, without requiring separate re loading of reports. Um, release 5 of the counter code of practice, as I mentioned earlier, is in the works. And the focus is on improved clarity and consistency, um, trying to make it easier uh, to both comply with the counter code of practice and to use counter reports. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail here beyond what I've just said, but you'll hear a lot more about this in the coming months. And then getting back to our challenge of reporting on ebook usage, a new report, Book Report 7, uh, is expected to become a requirement with Release 5. It's currently available as an optional report for those of you who want to pursue that with your content providers. Uh, but what it's doing is it's introducing the notion of a unique book view within a session and effectively removes the comparability problems that we see today between Book Report 1 and Book Report 2 and between various vendors offering Book Report 2. So the unique book view count for a given book would increment only once per session where that book was accessed regardless of how many pages or chapters or sections were viewed. So it no longer would matter whether how that book was divided up and presented to the user. So I'm going to wrap up um, <clears throat> with this slide. So when you're considering iPads using or the usage reporting in a larger context of counter, you know, some suggestions come to mind and, and I'm bringing up a couple of here, some of which you've probably already have been discussing at length. Um, the first which comes to mind is the inclusion of e-serials usage in the iPad circulation reporting. So as I was preparing for this, I took a look at the usage from a few of our usage consolidation customers. And um, the usage represented in their journal reports um, is typically five times greater than the total usage found in their book reports. So ignoring journal usage means that an important part of the collection is currently not being reflected in the iPad stats. And another set of metrics to consider, I think, is the use of abstract and indexing databases and discovery index indexes. Uh, so providing users with discovery tools it's an important part of getting users to the information they need. So having use of these tools reflected in a survey could help provide a measure of the overall effectiveness of the online information environment a given institution is providing its users. So I'd like to conclude by saying that counter reports offer most of the statistics needed to report on the usage of online collections. And thus, it does make a good platform for expanding the usage reporting within the iPad survey. And speaking for Counter, uh, we're here to help. So please feel free to reach out with questions or suggestions. Um, and you can either email me directly or contact uh, Lorraine Estelle on the, uh, on the Counter site. Happy to help. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chris and Mark Martin, who will talk more about how you go about actually collecting this information. Thank you. Hi, folks. So I'm going to try to tie my portion of this presentation back to both Chris's talk on um, collecting title counts and um, to Oliver's talk about counter. And if you are already familiar with counter and been using it, some of this may be pretty rudimentary. But if you haven't looked at your counter reports in a while or you just are kind of exploring this area new, I'm hoping to give you some practical hands-on tips for getting reports that you need for your survey. So the first part that I'm going to talk about here is getting title counts for that first section of the iPad survey. And a great tool that you may be able to use is your knowledge base and your link resolver. Particularly, you know, this is, if this is integrated in with your catalog and your discovery tool, this may really be where you're providing access to your electronic resources. Um, and for most people, this is going to be most helpful for serials. 
which are going to be part of the survey for 2016-2017 collection period. And it may also be helpful for you for books and multimedia if your link resolver provides a full range of that. Um, if you are, say, don't have all of your eBooks in your link resolver, and you're, you may then need to rely on title counts or your catalog or another means. But I'm going to walk through two examples of some common knowledge bases and how you can get title counts from them. So the first example, which um, comes courtesy of Oliver, and is for getting a count from the EBSCO Holdings Manager. And the example that I'm going to walk through here is collecting the book title count, but there is um, in that link at the bottom. And as you've probably heard, we will be sharing these slides so you don't have to worry about writing that down. But there is instructions for getting all sorts of media out of there um, from your knowledge base if you use EBSCO. So here um, we're going to kind of walk through the steps. And um, thanks again to Oliver for providing this. So anybody who's been to EBSCO Admin, this might look familiar. There is this holdings management um, up at number one. And um, you go there. You can get to your holdings manager. You have an option to download reports, which is over at number two. And, um, and then you can go down to number three, where you can choose your resource type. So in this particular example, we're choosing book. Um, you basically name your report something that's useful to you. Click on the big blue button at the bottom to get your file. Um, and then over here, you will be able to go to a download tab that EBSCO Admin provides. And they also have this handy link right here that is your title list summary, which takes us to that smaller spot right there um, where you can get a total count of unique titles. So this came from an example of someone who uses the um, Holdings Manager. My second example um, comes from getting your serial titles count out of SFX. And so this may look familiar to people that are using SFX for a knowledge base. And basically, you're logging into your SFX admin. Then you're going from the main page, which I didn't provide a screenshot here, but you go to your knowledge base tools or KB tools to export tools. And that brings up the, um, the shot here that we see where you've got this advanced export queries. You can select that you want to get this text file output. And in this case, we're getting serials. So we're going to select serials. SFX doesn't actually provide any multimedia. So if you have all your books in here, you could do monographs too. And we're going to limit our active portfolio to ones that are full text. Um, so you do that, and it will send you a text file in instantly or in a little while, depending on how big your, um, your knowledge base in there is. And then um, you can use Excel to do a little more manipulation to try to get things um, deduplicate it. So this is like the screenshot that you may have seen if you've used Excel to bring in text and convert it to an Excel spreadsheet. Um, it works pretty well for the uh, SFX output. A couple of quirks I noticed was that there are no actual column headings. Um, and then you want to make sure if you have a long number that's an identifier, like the SFX object ID, you need to make sure that you've selected text for that format because Excel, if it thinks it hits a really huge number, it's going to convert it to scientific notation and it's only going to keep significance up to 15 digits. So if you have an identifier over 15 digits, it's going to round them and then they're not unique anymore, which is you know, truly a horrible thing to happen. So everything else seemed to work pretty well in terms of the, the defaults, although if you've got a lot of non-Roman characters, you may want to choose UTF-8 just so that it looks cleaner. Um, once you're in Excel, going to the data ribbon, you can actually use a remove duplicates function. Um, and column E is the SFX ID in this particular case. And you can see we've got publishers weekly in 10 different portfolios. So we don't really want to have to count that 10 times. But we get this little remove duplicates come up. We're going to select it on the SFX object ID. So we're relying on SFX's knowledge base to help us with this. Excel deletes the duplicates. That count that we have left there, in this case, 130,068 e-journals, that's your count that you need for iPad for your electronic serials. So now I'm going to shift gears over to the, um, the second part of what I'd like to talk about today, which is obtaining your count of reports for reporting that digital usage slash circulation. So some things, if you're really starting at this from scratch and you haven't been collecting these before, I'm going to look at like a really basic way of collecting your usage statistics without necessarily going through an ERM or 
in really needing much anything else besides a spreadsheet. But the first thing that you have to think about is like, where are you going to get your statistics from? What are the platforms and providers that you have? And there's kind of these three categories here that you want to think about. Um, you've got publishers that are hosting their own content, like if you've got journals on Science Direct, those are all going to be Elsevier journals. You also have publishers that use a third-party platform, like you know the Royal Society titles are available on Highwire, as well as a number of other science and medicine titles. And then you have aggregators, which are licensing content from a wide variety of publishers and generally offer it as a package through a database, like Academic Search Complete on EBSCOhost or ABI Inform on ProQuest. Um, so you want to think about where you're getting that content from. And you may already have some information about this because what you're going to need is the username and passwords to be able to get into these provider websites or into their administrative websites to collect that data. And if you've already got that because you've had to customize things or because you've been collecting user statistics, then you've got a great start for this. And you have to do a lot of work kind of up front, but then it gets easier year by year. And if you're really not sure, you know, and you know you're getting some stuff through a consortia, you might be able to talk to people at your consortia to figure out what, where the administrative places are. You can talk to your reps and they'll probably help you out. Um, so this is walking through like some really basic steps if you're going to be doing these things sort of manually. And basically you have your sheet of providers, then you're going to identify those administrative URLs and the login information that you need for collecting your statistics. Um, the different formats that you're going to want to report and collect under each provider. And I would say although the JR1, the serial, is not necessary for iPads 2016-2017, that is something that's up for discussion. And it may be something that you just want to collect to find out how things are being used, how are your subscriptions being used. Um, we have the two book reports, the BR1 and the BR2, and then the multimedia, which is the MR1. Those are the reports that you really need for iPads. Um, you probably also want to include on this list providers where you can't get statistics, so you don't have to go through that process every year trying to figure it out. Um, and then you can put any notes in there if there's something that's particularly tricky about how to get the statistics. And as you work your way through the list, you can be recording that reporting period total in your spreadsheet that Oliver showed you earlier. So I'm going to walk through three different examples here of collecting statistics on three different sites. The first one being getting the book report one from EBSCO host. Uh, and this is the EBSCO admin module, which actually looks pretty similar to what we saw at the holdings manager. It's the same setup. So you have your institutional credentials. You log in. In this case, we're going to the tab called reports and statistics. And then um, you have options to select counter reports. And uh, counter R4, that's release four of counter. So following that, you get a, a drop-down box where you can choose the report that you want. So in this case, we've got book report one. And you can choose your time period based on your fiscal year. In this case, we have a fiscal year that ended June 30th. So we've got July 2015 through June 2016. Click that big um, yellow button. And then EBSCO is going to place the report on a separate tab for downloaded reports. And then you can go there and you can download it into a spreadsheet. Um, so opening it up in Excel, it's a little blurry here, I apologize, but you've got that reporting period total number. You record that in your master list, and then you can move on to your next platform. So let's say that you also have eBooks from Springerlink. Now Springerlink offers the BR2, and unlike EBSCO, they don't have a separate admin site per se but you actually go there um, with an administrative privileged login. And this is, this is fairly common with some publishers. And then your login gives you special options that like your typical library patron would not have. So here you know, I've signed in. Um, this is actually Robert Flesher, who's our Electronic Resources Manager at the University of Chicago. And we have this option for the admin dashboard, which gives us library specific information, including usage. So navigating to the usage statistics, we see a very similar drop-down. We have the options um, of what report we want. You can see Springer does not offer the BR1. So even though BR1 is the preferred um, book usage counting tool for iPads, 
we don't have that as a choice, so we're going to take the BR2, which will give you the book chapter downloads, and that is how Springer presents it on their site. Um, then, once again, you get this great Excel spreadsheet. You have your reporting period total. And you will note, because it is BR2, that your number of usage per title will seem a lot higher than what you would get off of, say, EBSCOhost, which had the BR1. My last example here is from Alexander Street Press for the multimedia one. And for brevity, I've simplified some of the steps that I'm showing in the slides because they're very similar to the other ones. Uh, like EBSCO, there is an administrative website for Alexander Street Press. And there is a section right there for usage statistics. You have a very similar drop-down options. In this case, you know, we've chosen the MR1 report. Once again, we're looking at fiscal year. And in the Alexander Street, what they've done is they actually provide you the report directly in HTML. So if you don't feel like you want to save the report for any other reason, you can just grab that reporting period total number for your main spreadsheet. But if you feel like you do want to keep the report, you can also download it to Excel and have it available for other purposes. So that's the, the manual way of collecting reports. It can become onerous if you have a lot of different platforms. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, I work with a lot of platforms here, and at this point we are still working under pretty much this process. Um, so it's certainly feasible, but it's not necessarily the easiest way to do it, and it's something we are looking at some different options here as well. There are a number of tools that are out there that can help you collect and manage your statistics, and they can also help you integrate them with acquisition and other data, so you can calculate things like cost per use. Um, they come from some different areas of library tools, like your subscription agents, like EBSCO and Herathowitz. They can help you bring in some of the, your journal acquisition information. They may be through your library management system for people that are using like Alma or OCLC WorldShare. They have um, statistics support. And they also may be integrated with your link resolver or with an ERM system like Serial Solutions, SFX. Um, and uh, like the open source system Coral has a usage module. And these systems will also can provide a sushi client, or though you can also get an open source sushi client, and that can automate the harvesting. Now, um, things have been, like become a lot more standardized with counter. So if you looked at counter reports or you looked at sushi a couple years ago, and it seemed like it was more, you were having more exceptions and things that were actually running through, it may be worth a look again to see um, if Sushi could work for you better. And the, the last slide that I'm going to share here is some resources for usage data. And I know there are some questions that came up about this. Uh, we do have a link to the Project Counter website here, and that lists counter compliant publishers. Uh, there's also a link to Usage, which Oliver mentioned is the community run website that's focused on the usage of electronic resources. It's a great place for asking questions, for kind of getting information about issues or problems with reports. Um, I've also included some columns that Oliver wrote in uh, Serials Librarian on implementing Sushi and Counter, as well as an introduction to Usys. Um, and the, the final resource here, where we are actually kind of waiting for the link, it didn't quite get up in time, is a longer presentation that Oliver gave to the Texas Library Association about Counter and Sushi, and it both gives some more information on the database reports, which we're not really covering here since they're not applicable to iPads at this point, and information on Sushi and how um, you can get that set up as well. So before we go to the Q&A, I'm going to turn this back over to Bob for some final comments about future issues related to the iPad survey. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, a couple of things. The task force, um, the next, the next task force um, group um, that convenes, um, hopefully um, by the end of the year or so, are going to be looking at a couple of questions that have have come up, um, specifically one from iPads and one from the library community. So future data collections, um, a collection. We're going to look at what is a shared library collection? And when you start thinking about that, um, there are uh, just 
numerous um, examples and instances of different types of shared library collections. Um, IPEDS is interested in collecting this. So it will be um, uh, the task force uh, membership will help um, IPEDS in terms of, of looking at um, how to approach that particular uh, uh, question. A second one is e-serials usage. The 2016-2017 uh, Academic Libraries component will not collect information on e-serials, um, the usage of e-serials. Um, however, that's one of the, the most, that's probably one of the, the, um, uh, the larger uh, data um, compilations we have in libraries is, is our e-serial usage. Um, so we're going to be working with, or the task force will be, is going to be working with um, iPads in terms of uh, looking at how it can that be collected um, and defined, and a part of that comes down to the JR1 and, and that type of thing. ACRL's annual survey is already collecting information on e-serials usage, and we can uh, share our experience um, with iPads in terms of how that was handled. The other thing that we would like to, to work with is the human resources component of IPEDS. Um, Chris Cody is not responsible for human resources, um, but in the academic library component, what, what, they, what is collected is um, expenses for library staff. The classification of library staff actually sits in the HR component. And we have brought this up, the task force has had a uh, conversation with the HR uh, component survey director at IPEDS about some of, of, of the issues we're seeing with this, and we will uh, hopefully continue that discussion. But in the meantime, um, for everybody who's, who's here listening, um, your HR, uh, the HR component information, which includes the library uh, staffing classification information, uh, is, is oftentimes provided by your Office of Human Resources. It may not be uh, collected and reported in the manner in which you would find it to be agreeable. So you may want to talk to your, um, your OHR, your Office of Human Resources, um, and or your IPEDS key holder um, to find out how the information is being reported and by whom. Uh, but we're going to be hopefully working on that next. So next thing we want to do is to, is to go to the questions and answers, and I'm going to turn that over to Martha. Thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, the one question uh, that I think uh, um, we can hear again, the answer is, why haven't we included ethereal usage in the 2016-17 uh, iPads? Can you give us some background on that? Bob Dugan? Oh, okay. I, I was going to, I didn't hear that. Um, the, the, yeah, there's, the reason why is that we're still, um, we're still trying to figure out how to collect it. Um, there is, of course, the JR1s, which would be the counter JR1s, which would be probably the most consistent and most usable. However, um, there, are, there's a, there are a lot of nuances to the collection of these serials usage that we just, um, we, we just haven't been able to deal with yet. So um, one of the things comes down to, I think there was a question about um, usage of, um, of uh, uh, electronic uh, serials that are other than journals. Um, we, we haven't, we, we're, we're still looking at this, and I'm, I'm not convinced yet um, that we have, um, that we know all of the ways in which libraries collect uh, e-serials usage information. So that, that's why we, didn't, we did not um, push to have that included in the IPEDS 2016-2017 uh, survey because we thought it might confuse people more than, than be clear, and we, we think that we need a little bit more time. Um, and, and the experiences we're picking up from the ACRL annual survey in order to make sure that the instructions are clear when, when we start looking at e-serials usage. Chris, I'm going to ask you to, to chime in on that too. Yeah, and so, so with the recommendation from the task force um, not to include e-serial usage, um, something we look at at IPEDS, and I mentioned specifically when I was discussing how we get our survey changes clearance through the OMB, 
is the burden on the institution or the burden, and specifically the burden of this direct question. And with our discussions with the task force on, you know, the uncertainty out there about collecting um, e-serial usage compared to a little bit more clarification on how we can collect um, physical serials um, circulation, um, we felt that it wasn't, um, we didn't have enough of an answer on burden. We didn't have enough of an answer on how could institutions acquire this information, were we comfortable asking it, and so it's something that we decided not to include um, in this collection cycle based off the recommendation from the task force and as well, you know, not having an idea of what the burden would be on the institution and whether it would be too great to ask the question as of now. Um, so that's where we're hoping future discussions with the task force as well as um, uh, ACRL has been kind enough that they're going to include it on their survey that we might have a better idea looking at theirs and seeing if it is something that's easier to collect and have a little bit more understanding what this burden might look like um, before, as a, a federal entity, we start asking that it, or requiring it be collected as part of the academic library yeah. yeah, it's all about yeah. um, just, just to follow up on that, we really do want to collect e-serials usage information. It's just a matter of of making sure that when we collect it, it has validity and reliability, and that is easily explained. I'm done. Oliver? Yeah, Oliver? I was just going to, uh, it's Oliver, just wanted to quick, quickly uh, uh, mention that as you're doing your deliberations for the, 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 the next survey, uh, please feel free to uh, engage with Counter. Um, because the journal report is a bit of a misnomer today. For example, journal reports are really for anything that's a serial, um, not just technically journals. And so it would be good for counter and ARL, ACRL, iPads, et cetera, to be aligned on their definitions of things. And that could help out things immensely, particularly with publishers knowing what to put in what reports. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, yes, there is some experience in the collection of usage statistics and usage of serials. A A ARL statistics has been including that item for a number of years, but it is a moving target uh, as um, new products uh, uh, appear um, and also new technologies of how to deal with the usage statistics appear. We do have a question related to this issue uh, by Scott Pagel. Pagel. What if patrons are accessing online data that traditionally would have been in books or serials, but it, that is disaggregated in a database? Example, patron would traditionally have accessed a case in a reporter volume but in LexisNexis and Westlaw, they are accessing the case directly, and one doesn't really consider it a count of an online serial. So is use not counted at all in this case? So he's basically so it, talking it, it, about database use. Dugan? Yeah, so it's Oliver. I can, I can perhaps um, offer some uh, thoughts on that. Uh, so in the case where content is disaggregated into something like an EBSCO host database, I have a lot of experience with that, um, then the, even if it came from the print, um, that item would be designated as coming from monograph or coming from a serial, and the usage would show up in the corresponding book report or, or journal reports. So in that case, usage would be provided. In the case of LexisNexis and Westlaw, I guess it would depend on whether they offer counter reports or not as to whether a counter report would show, but I would think the same thing would apply. Thank you. Um, anyone else wants to add any uh, thoughts on, on this question? Yeah, this is Kristen. And I, I think there are some cases that um, do challenge where usage can be counted. Like if you have a reference work that really gets changed into a database, sometimes that provider is not 
giving you a, a counter book report, for example, or even if maybe it would be volumes in a book, um, but they're giving you a database report and maybe they're giving you something that's non-standard. Uh, the iPad survey is not requiring you to use counter. Um, so you could probably use some um, interpretation and try to determine what would be the closest thing where you can get use if you do have a non-standard report from a publisher that you think most accurately represents like a, a, a use that would be as close to comparable as you can come up with. Uh, and then there may also be cases where it is so radically different in how it's being presented that it, it is hard to figure out how to count it. And I think that's something that the task force is still wrestling with a little bit and that probably speaks to some of the reason why we hadn't yet included the, um, the, the serials count. Yes. Thank you, Chris. And clearly, yes, it's a moving uh, target uh, and the landscape and ecosystem of electronic resources and their usage is is shifting. Um, the, um, there are a number of other questions that have been answered in the chat box, and I don't want to take uh, uh, too much time with them, but I do want to highlight one of them. Erika Linke asked, where does one report expenses for data sets? and for access to text files or purchasing of text files uh, for text mining. And um, I believe this was answered already that uh, the expenditures will be reported either under ongoing or as one-time purchases depending on how the expense occurred. Um, so just to highlight that we have received some questions related to other issues. ARL will publish the uh, questions that are in the chat box and their answers. So I'm not going to repeat them now, um, but uh, we can move into our closing section. And I'm going to invite uh, Bob Dugan to offer us a closing. Hi, everybody, and, and the task force really appreciates your taking the time to, to join us today in, in terms of this. Um, we hope you found it um, useful um, and that, there is, um, that, that it was informative. Um, one of the things is we try to keep the academic library community aware of what's going on through press releases. Um, that's usually um, from ACRL and from ARL, and discussion lists. Um, every once in a while, we pop up on the ARL assess list. Um, so it, it, we, we try to keep up with this um, in terms of, of listening to it. Um, I did a, um, a, a FAQ last year from when we were doing the uh, ACRL um, uh, survey, and um, I had almost 4,000 hits on the um, on the uh, uh, database, on the um, FAQ. So it's, it's one of those things in which we, we try to keep people aware of what's going on and, and just kind of you know, keep your um, radar up in terms of, of uh, you know, information coming. If you have comments or suggestions for the task force, if you've got, you, know, you want to know what's going on, um, contact Martha or, an, or Mary Jane Petrowski. Their, their emails are on this um, particular slide. And I'm going to turn it over now to Mary Jane. Mary Jane? Thank Maybe you, Martha. Yeah. I had to unmute myself. So I was just thanking everyone for coming and um, just wanted to reassure you that we will be um, posting the link to the webcast um, widely and we will be incorporating it into the, um, the FAQ that, that Bob just mentioned and we will be making that um, readily available. So I hope you will share that with your colleagues who uh, weren't able to attend today. And just uh, a closing from me, thank you to all of you who attended. A reminder that we did uh, 
um, work with uh, task force number one that addressed uh, a number of issues, and the webinar from last year is actually available for those who may have uh, forgotten that part of the history of, of the work of the task force that works with iPads, uh, the joint task force from ARL and ACRL that works with iPads. The, today's webinar uh, captures the uh, advice and changes we have uh, been forwarding to iPads for the upcoming data collection. iPads will launch this fall. And as you've heard uh, from a number of speakers, there are a few issues that are still on the table and uh, we expect a future collaboration uh, between ACRL and ARL uh, to resolve uh, and provide guidance and advice uh, to um, iPads and also to everybody in the community. On this note, I would like to thank everybody who has attended this webcast and thank again the joint task force members that you see listed on this slide. They represent all types of academic libraries, uh, federal agencies, and uh, uh, we look forward to um, continuing uh, their good work into the future. Thank you. I would like to thank all of our presenters, Mary Jane Petrowski, Martha Kirilidou, Robert Dugan, Chris Cody, Oliver Pesh and Kristen Martin, and thanks to all of our participants for attending this afternoon's webinar. The recording will be available on ARL's YouTube channel next week, and I'm going to post the link in the um, chat box for everyone. We will send the recording to all registered participants as well. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all so much for attending and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.